been a team effort that's taken a couple of years. We've republished with pictures a book that was written in 1945 by Father Crispin Jones about our area, about the personalities, about the places, and every, every Kwani home needs to have a copy of this book. Uh, and it's for sale for $25. So if any of you want to pick one up at the end of the lecture, please stop by the table. Thank you. Right. And from the Kwani Historical Society board, Charlotte organized the program, so she'll introduce the speakers. Charlotte? Good evening, and thank you very much for coming to the second program of our 2018 series. Um, tonight we're focusing on, is this working? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is. Tonight we're focusing on how to do an old-fashioned clam bake. And we have two speakers here. Dick Hutchins, former resident of East West Farm, and the best square dancer this range ever knew. <laughs> <laughs> and Sue Howe, um, longtime summer friend, um, and her mother, I have to tell you, her mother was the best fisherman, one of the best fishermen on East Beach for a long time. Now we're gonna start with Dick, and I wanna say he came, he moved to New Jersey last year, and he and Glenda have come back specially to be with us tonight and talk with us. So please welcome Dick. I'm not sure if I need this, but hello. Oh, yes. You need it. I need it? I like it. Oh, my golly. Now what am I going to do with my other hand? <laughs> i got to juggle all the paperwork? At any rate, for former neighbors, for friends, and for invited guests, it's nice to come home. Our So we're supposed to be learning about um, how to put on a New England clam bake, and I won't give you all the background and all of that, because Tom, I think, is ready. Why don't you throw the first one up? I don't know which one it is. There it is. OK. Um, uh, let's see. Um, there's some people you might recognize. My dad is in the uh, yellow sh um, to the left of the, which looks like the teepee, and uh, that's the fire room. So that's for clam bake. What was the date on that one, Tom? It was on the barn door or something. Oh, oh the, the second one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's take a look at that second one. Yeah, that was the bake on the seventeenth of August in seventy-five. So we um, put on twenty-two of these clam bakes. This is the tricky look thing, you know that? Anyway, uh, 22 years, uh, and it was when I would travel up to work with my three older brothers, and we'd prepare for the, the event, and uh, it was a family occasion or festivity. Of course, cousins and their friends and so forth would, would attend. Probably the largest one that we put on had over 100 people. So we were equipped because during the 22 years, my uh, parents celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. And a cousin, Trudy, she was a very active person in the um, uh, Sweet Adelines. And uh, so they came to perform at the Clam Bake. So there's a, there, there a whole party that's uh, on the parade ground or on the bake grounds and uh, so that was kind of a fun evening. Anyway, um, that's the fire room. You could see where we're, we're uh, creating a little smoke. I, I think there's a fire truck in one of the pictures. My brothers, at least my brother Robert, how many know Robert? Sam? Bob? <laughs> he, uh, he was active in the uh, fire company so the kids kind of enjoyed if a fire truck showed up. Uh, not because there was a danger, it was just for the fun of it. 
Next one. And here the fires burned down. You can see the, uh, the bed. Uh, early on, we used uh, head size field stone, and they were uh, to uh, be heated, and then uh, seaweed would be placed on the uh, hot rocks, and that would create steam, and we'll see more about that. But here's when we're raking the fire off, and uh, it would be a little hot. So Brother Sam or Bob on, on with the fire hose. So the fire truck was there because that's, uh, you know, one of their brush fire nozzles. Just to cool down the guy that's raking the fire off. Because we didn't want any burning lumber in the bay. We just needed the hot coals. And the more hot coals, the better the bake would be. It would take about an hour to cook the bake. We can take a look at the next one. Um, later on, we uh, were better organized. Uh, you can see that we had baskets, so the contents of the bake could be uh, placed in the, uh, in the rack. Later on, we, uh, rather than have a, a wooden structure that those uh, uh, containers that held the food, we actually had a aluminum one. And uh, I would make uh, quahog clam chowder, or quahog chowder as we called it, and uh, I had a pot, pot about so big, you know, I could feed three other people easy. Uh, so that was a part of my come up to Rhode Island and play like a Rhode Islander, shuck out the uh, quahogs, grind them up, to prepare the uh, potatoes and do all of that. So that was served at noon on bake day. So you'd light, light the fire so that the fire would uh, have a chance to burn down. The bake would go on maybe three o'clock and then we'd eat between four and five. Next one. Oh uh, yes. Now not all uh, New England clam bakes have uh, lobster, but uh, one of my brothers, Brother Bob, he, uh, he actually uh, was the guy that harvested lobster. He had lobster pods, so he'd go out and and uh, so it looks like, yeah, we had a pretty good bait there. I don't know how many lobster there, but there's one per person. And of course, there's some people that don't like stuff that comes from the sea. And, you know, so they wanted chicken or something else. It says it's working. The green light is on. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. This is the bake uh, after the uh, contents that were shown, the, the corn, the potatoes, the fish, the uh, contents. And we cover that with a canvas. And then here we're making sure that we capture all the steam and let it build up. Uh, so that's Cousins. Uh, yeah, Cousins or uh, and what they're doing is just sealing the uh, canvas so as the steam built up under the canvas, it could billow up and not uh, lose the uh, uh, steam. Next one, Tom. Here's where we're checking to see whether or not uh, the bake is done. And how do we do that? Uh, if you can hear me, we had a big potato and we'd stick it under the canvas. And when we thought bake was finished to, to prove that everything was uh, was cooked if the potato popped we were ready to serve and eat <laughs> next one that's brother Louie with uh, a bucket that's uh, oh, that's an early frame uh, we have a more sophisticated one but you can see the quantity of, of steam that's remaining, and this is at least an hour after the bake was put together. <coughs> Next one. Okay. Uh, the lobster on top, we pull those off. Um, and of course, this is all with the flavor that from, from the seaweed. Uh, just, just great. 
Yeah, so you basically you would have hot coals and the stones. Later on, we, we actually used steel, which was great because we, you can't recycle stone. Once you heat them up, you throw them out. So you gotta go out and harvest more and sacrifice those. So my oldest brother owned a machine shop and he rebuilt a piece of equipment that allowed us to use steel rather than stone. And we probably used that, those for, of the 22, we probably had those for more than 50% of the uh, bakes. And that made life a lot easier for us older guys. <laughs> Next turn. Brother Bob, he's serving the lobster there. And uh, that's the serving line. And you could see those baskets that were apart in the bag made it more convenient. Typically, most, in fact, the first clam bake that I ever attended was uh, at the old Grange Hall. Uh, this is the old Grange Hall, and it's still existing today. But we, uh, oh, there it is. <laughs> I held the picture up and boom. Talk about technology, instantaneous. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> um, uh, that was the, where I attended the first um, clam bake, and it was held in a wooden barrel. Um, you know, I don't know if it was an old uh, wine barrel or truck, might have been. And uh, in that situation, they would heat the stones in the fire, put them in the bottom of the barrel, add the seaweed, add the contents in, and they use bags to contain the, the various products so that you could cook the, the uh, perform the bake and then pull out the bags and serve the content. Serving line. Are we going backwards now, Okay, now, uh, bakes are a labor of love, at least it was for the four of us. It was time for brother bonding and uh, and it, it, it was uh, a lot of fun, but a lot of work. But we made improvements along the way to make it easier for us. When we got rid of the stone, we didn't have to harvest stone. We already had that problem solved. And it worked extremely well. So, if you're seriously interested, before you endeavor in doing your own, I can recommend and uh, encourage you to attend a clam bake at the um, uh, um, let's see, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, oh, oh. It, it's up there, yeah, yeah, uh, it's the Francis Farm, there it is, yeah, and I, I, this is their current schedule, so maybe you could, uh, uh, if you wanted to see, what they do is, I think they're still using, or they were, using stone, and then they, they pile bags of the contents and cover it up and but that's right over the line from Providence in Rehoboth and it might be worth for if you're wanting to taste a little bit of a clam bake that's a good place to try it the last time that I was there they were still doing it about as typical as it has been done for who, who knows a long time ago has anyone been there yet from here no one? Okay. So keep that in mind. And I have copies of these documents, so if you need that for reference, they're available. What else do I have, Tom? Oh, That's it. my speech is done. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes? You said our stones are not recyclable. I mean, they can't be reheated? Oh, no. No, no. They, the fire is so intense that the stones begin to flake apart. So you can't use them a second time. But the steel just worked perfectly. I mean, it was... So you built the fire. Was it inside that teepee? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that was fuel for the fire. There was probably more fuel underneath that. That was to get rid of all... You know, so there was the a teepee, ladder there. The teepee burns. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, there was an old ladder in there, and I noticed that a couple uh, steps were missing. So we had to take care of that problem. And then you put that old metal rack over top of it. Uh, well, what we would do then, once the stone was heated, 
and we rake the fire off to make sure there's no burning pieces of wood. And then we would take uh, the uh, teenagers of our four, four brothers, uh, they would go down to the shore and they'd bring up probably uh, eight or ten bags of uh, seaweed. And it's the seaweed that has the little, the little uh, the bubbles, on. bubbles on them. Yeah. So that's where the good stuff is. You get enough heat on them, they burst, that creates the steam. And so everything in the bay is taking on this universal flavoring. Uh, somebody had, yes. No, 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 that's one of nature's, no, 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 you get that rock weed and you just harvest it. So why doesn't sand get in the food? Because we don't put it in. Where do you put the seaweed then? Hmm? Where do you put the seaweed? Well, the seaweed is, is just, you know, that's like fertilizer for Mother Nature, you spread it on the land. In fact, when I was raised on the farm, we used to go down with our tractor and harvest seaweed and spread it on the farmland. Yes. So my second question was, um, you start talking about a smaller plant bake and that you could do it in a wooden barrel. Yes. And you mentioned that you could put the food in a bag and just put the food in and pull the bag out. So what kind of bag did you use? Well, the burlap bags. Burlap. See, I'm a farmer. So there's potato sacks, yeah. the old burlap. So the uh, the seaweed would be harvested in that, and that's basically a bag. But I'm not saying that that's the only bag that you could use because the barrel is kind of limited in terms of its uh, capacity. And the burlap wouldn't burn. Well, no, because the uh, the fire is out, yeah. and in a barrel you're using rocks. Yeah. You bury the rocks with seaweed, and then you stack your contents on top of that. Cover it over and wait for a while. Yes? If you were going to do this in a barrel, what would be your order of your stuff? Like well, after I'm, the... Well, I, the I, you know, the, 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 there were potatoes. Probably we would put those on the bottom and kind of go up from there. And if you want to enjoy lobster and a kind of bake, you would put those on top. And, and, and uh, you know, it was such a, we, we used to have little necks. So at, at uh, noon time, I would make uh, a pot of chowder, but that chowder had to be made the day before, cooled, reheated, and if you haven't sampled my ch chowder, something is missing in your life. <laughs> I learned it from my mother, and if she didn't, uh, she, she, she was a good cook. Any more? Yes, Anne. Um, Dick, I just wanted to mention to everybody that downstairs after the program, there is a display case with a to a barrel of hammock. Oh. So that might be interesting. Well, let me take a look at that. I'll, I'll see if it beats the, <laughs> the, 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 the inspector's. Uh, yeah, criteria. Yes. What did you charge for your clam bake? Well, I was the I was the guy that took care of all the paperwork. I didn't bring my attaché case tonight, but the twenty two years of of information uh, is in my attaché bag, which the zippers, you know, the zipper shot so a piece of uh, a shoestring keeps it together for me. And my wife would have been embarrassed if I brought it anyway. So I said, I won't take that. She'll think I'm some kind of guy. <laughs> Anyone else? Going once, going twice. Hey, where, where was that uh, plan they felt? On West Beach Road. Right in the property. And if you go around where the cottages are, on the left-hand side is a vacant lot, and it's still vacant. That owned by one of my brothers. That was our bake site. 
And Quanee Pond was where we harvested shellfish for the bake. And more than once we got caught in the fog out there. That's an interesting thing. My wife could probably tell you about that. Any more? Well, I'll be around, so if you haven't, visit with me. I'm for Sue Dusta Hat. Um, I'd like to add that um, my sister and I were mother's helpers for the Dexter family. And one of the jobs that we had on a fairly regular basis was to <clears throat> wrap the packages of sa sausage and other <laughs> foods that were served at their clam mix. But I really can't remember all of the details now. So Sue is here and she's gonna fill us in on how they did it. Sue Howe, Sue Dexter. For those of you who do not, can you hear me in the back? Yeah. I know you could. No, I don't mean it. Believe me. I can project this. Um, for those of you who do not know me, I live at 42 Highland Road uh, since 1944. And uh, my folks did clam banks there for friends, neighbors, business associates. I think they started as friends because we lived in Westerly during the winter, the friends would come down. And then I think my father felt very guilty that all of the neighboring houses were watching these clam bakes go on. So he included all the neighboring houses. Um, and it kept getting bigger and bigger. And not as large as the Hutchins one, because we didn't quite get that large. They got to the 30, 35, 40 people doing it as a social event. The social event started someplace early afternoon when certain male attendees would come and go over to the breachway and get rockweed, very similar to what the Hutchins did. And that was their job. And at the same time, some of the women would come and help my mother and a couple of the Duryea girls uh, take and wrap in, do the clams in cheesecloth, about a quart of steamers per person, in cheesecloth, tie it up so that it looked like a bag. They also had codfish steaks, which they did in manila paper, manila, heavy manila paper, and had to be twisted at the ends because my father said it was much easier to get them out of the boiler bake, so they had to be twisted. They also had chicken for those people who did not want the seafood. We had the same problem. Yes. <laughs> and we also had sausage. And in my recollection, it was not Italian sausage or Portuguese sausage. It was the regular breakfast links, as far as I remember. And they were tied up in the manila paper and we, the ends. We, we and so were the chicken legs, yeah. all separately. Yeah, the uh, sausage, we, we would wrap that with bacon. Oh, no, you were, oh, that was true. We just did the sausage. Well, we had lots of help. Well, that's right. We had a lot more people. So they do all of that in the afternoon, and it would work out that everybody then, all the other people would come, and then there was this big to-do. They'd all sit around, and our house had a garage on the back side of it with the um, cement apron. So that's where my father would set up. His boilers. These are copper. And believe it or not, this is one of the original ones. I dug it out of the cellar and all I did was rinse it out. And here it is. It was used for many of them. And they would start this ceremony that he had going with this thing. And it would start out where he would put the rockweed in the bottom. Then he put the lobsters in the bottom, different from the Hutchins one. He would put the lobsters in the bottom and then you put a layer of rockweed. Then the next thing to be put in there was the codfish wrapped in the manila paper and a layer of rockweed. 
and then you put the chicken legs and a layer of rockweed, and then you put the sausage. Guess what? Another layer of rockweed. Then the corn, which was husked just for the outside first layer of husk taken off, and the rest are still there. And they were all laid in there with rockweed. Then the bags of clams and rockweed. And then, of course, the potatoes, because when the potatoes were done, the bake was done. All right, and there was the, some rockweed and then one potato on the top. The lid had to fit on very snug. Oh, wait a minute, I forgot. Then there was a big ceremony because you put one quart of salt water poured over this. And it was like this big event when he got to that. Oh, he had you know, And then he put the lid on very, very tight. And you put it on the fire. Our fires were in, and I don't even know what you call them, great square bin like this, about that far off the ground. He would start them early in the afternoon with wood, then put the charcoal on top of that till the charcoal got hot. And each one of these boilers had its own grate. So they would have two or three of these when they did them. And that's how they would cook. And again, one hour-ish from the time that it started to steam again. And until that potato was done. And that's when the party started at the house. Because up until that point, everybody was working to do all of this. And I think part of my, my fond memories was watching all of this ceremony that they created, my parents created out of this. And it was an event for them. It was always either the last Saturday in July or the first Saturday in August, depending on how corn was that year. You know, and they made it as that was their annual thing. Now someplace I have, since somebody asked about the financial part of this, in 1957, oh, they started in 1944, and they went to 1962 or 63, someplace in there. In 1957, the 14th annual one, a half a bushel of steamers, the clams, was $6.50 <laughs> from Abbott's. We all know where Abbott's is in Noe. Yeah. The potatoes for 30 people was 60 cents. The corn for three and a half dozen was $1.75 at Sandy's. Okay. Oh, you got yours too? Well, this is from. Oh, Jonathan. that's. Uh, uh, yeah, if I can look at the Johnson price. Johnson Oh, yeah. That, okay. <laughs> the fish, nine pounds of codfish steaks were $7.20. 24 chicken legs, $8. The sausage, seven pounds, $5.25. 31 lobsters. Anybody want to guess? Eight bucks. <laughs> <laughs> the total for the food was $37 for 30 people. I really wanted to, now I know there's a computer place that I could have gone on and translated that number to today's cost, but I didn't do it. Then they always had coffee and watermelon for dessert. Heaven forbid, yeah, you cut it and you got watermelon and everybody should, yeah, okay. And, oh yes, oh the butter, oh I also have seven pounds of butter was $4.97. This is my mother who did that kind of thing. Okay. So on a smaller scale, and for you who asked about doing it yourself, this is the self-contained version and you don't have to have the, the teepee with the fire and all the rest of it. You don't need a fire truck. I uh, didn't need a fire truck, because you have to remember, this was being done at 42 Highland Road, yeah. right by the beach, okay? What we had in the one part, of, and the rock is still there, there is a rock in the yard that is very flat, and it's still there, probably up to the up feet deep, and that's where the fires were, the three, grates were put on top of that so that it was stone underneath. It wasn't grass. We weren't going to light the whole neighborhood on fire. Yes? Quick question. When you put 
that bin on top of the grates, is the fire still going? It's at charcoal. That time? It's the simmering. It's the charcoal. So, so same, same as the same as him where the fire's because out. Because that keeps it. If one of the notes that was on one of the things from uh, the paperwork that I was reading, it said, "Don't have the fire going so hard because it will burn the bottom of the bake." It had to be a steady, constant fire, but you couldn't really rev it up and rank it up to because it would burn it. Okay, yeah, so it had to be a, a constant fire. fire that would keep this, and because the rockweed was in there with the little balls of water that's inside of that, you know, that kept the steam going, and the one quart of water that they poured over it, that was enough to keep steam to cook this whole thing. Anybody else? I get away with only one question. <laughs> Are you available to come to our party? <laughs> I do have, if anybody, yeah, I have the boiler bay recipe for four people. So you'd have to multiply it all out. I think we could all handle that. Basically tells you what to do and exactly what I just said to you, the layers and how to do it. It's very simple. If anybody needed it, just I can email it to you. That's not a problem. Okay. But it was always a fun event. Um, so was it her a BYOB or? You know what? I was only a kid, Graham. What would I know? I don't think so. I think it was supplied. I don't know. But it was quite an event because one of my other fond memories, and my mother would be having a fit if she heard this, was we had floodlights on the house to the backyard. Oh, it was all in big picnic tables that were out there, and we had floodlights on the back of the house. And I, I remember at 10, 10.30 at night, they'd start to sing. <laughs> and it wasn't pretty. <laughs> but they all thought they were being wonderful and were singing. But that's why they had to invite the neighbors after a while. <laughs> yeah, one, one thing that, that we did to entertain the crowd was we'd have a, 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 a right, a, a, you know, all the, Tug of, the war. Rope. Tug of war. Tug of war. That's it. Yeah, and uh, so that was always fun because you know there's guys digging in their heels and getting dragged in this way and then. This way. Mm -hmm. and Did you it, have kids? You had kids there. Hmm? The families, all the families were there. You had kids and. Oh yeah. Yeah. See, we, this was all adults. Oh. oh. This yeah, was well, all that adults. Was an upscale one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think probably my two brothers and I were the only kids that were there. <laughs> Well, enjoy, folks. It was a pleasure doing this with you. Thank you.